biotic and abiotic factors. So in an ecosystem, uh, we need to think about the interaction of the community of living organisms and all the non-living parts of that environment. And those two things uh, make up our biotic components, those are the living things, and the non-living things are abiotic. So an ecosystem is that interaction between biotic and abiotic. So let's have a look at this pond system here. We have populations of fish, that's groups of similar organisms, populations of plants, water lilies, and we have lots of other organisms living in this community um, of organisms, so frogs, uh, other types of plants and snails. Um, and also affecting the pond are all the abiotic factors. So in this example, we might have the climate, uh, the wind conditions, the amount of rainfall, uh, the sunlight that's hitting the pond, that might be affecting the temperature as well as the amount of light available for photosynthesis, and there will be rocks and soil making up the base of the pond um, or affecting the mineral content of the water or the pH of the water, and all of those things will work together to um, help establish how big a population of plants and animals can be sustained within that ecosystem. So if we were to gather together all the abiotic factors, they fall into a few categories. Climate factors, chemical and physical factors, edaphic factors, that's to do with soil, and things like fire. So if we're looking at these non-living components, we might consider temperature, rainfall, humidity, uh, wind intensity and direction and sunlight as climate factors. Um, chemical factors and physical factors include gases available, so oxygen, carbon dioxide, maybe other gases uh, like hydrogen sulfide, um, and the acidity of water or, if we're thinking about soil, the acidity of soil, um, the type of soil, how compact it is, has it got any air spaces in it, and in the Australian ecosystems, fire is very important um, in order to clear areas, uh, release nutrients, perhaps cause germination. Um, so those are some of the non-living factors you might want to consider when thinking about an ecosystem. Uh, biotic factors, these are anything to do with living organisms. Uh, food availability, the number of predators in a system, maybe the introduction of a new predator. Um, diseases, again, the introduction perhaps of a new disease. And competition, competition between um, organisms that are the same. So maybe they're competing for mates or perhaps it's competition um, for living space. Um, maybe it's competition for food. Um, so these are all different uh, biotic factors, living factors that could be uh, affecting our ecosystem. It's best to think of some examples. So here, um, this picture gives you an idea of a tropical rainforest. Um, in an area like this, you can support a lot of life. Um, we have a warm environment, a wet environment, plenty of sunshine. So you're going to get a huge variety of plants. And because of the large variety of plants, at the bottom of the food web, you will then be able to support lots of herbivores because they've got lots to eat. And then you'll be able to support lots of carnivores because they have lots to eat. And there are lots of habitats within this that places that things can live. Um, so hopefully competition for resources and competition for space uh, will um, uh, not be quite so um, strict and you will be able to get a large diversity and a large number of organisms surviving in this type of ecosystem. We can contrast this with um, a desert ecosystem. So anywhere, whether it's a hot desert or a cold desert, and anywhere with little rainfall, it's very difficult for animals and plants to survive in large numbers. Because all organisms, animals and plants, lose water by evaporation. And if they can't replace it very easily, then that's going to restrict their success in that ecosystem. So you have to be very well adapted to live in a desert ecosystem. So you can see from these two pictures, not a lot of things live there. doesn't mean there's nothing living there. It just means it's a bit harder for things to survive in these ecosystems. You can also think about microclimates. So my example here is 
the area underneath a log. So you might have a, um, a log in a forest, um, might be quite a dry area in general, but underneath the log it could be quite damp and humid and dark and there are lots of areas where things can live, different habitats. So you might find you have ecosystems that exist within microclimates. Um, oxygen is an extremely important gas. Um, all animals need it to um, survive because you need it for respiration. Uh, plants provide it, um, but it can also be carried, dissolved in water from where a plant has produced it or picked up from the air. And you can see in this example that a fast and active swimming fish like a salmon is going to survive better in fast flowing water that has lots of oxygen dissolved in it compared to the bottom of a lake or a pond where still water will not have a lot of oxygen. So animals will um, choose ecosystems that suit their needs um, and there will be adaptations that these animals have that allows them to survive well in particular ecosystems. Light is key because light allows photosynthesis and plants have to be at the beginning of all food webs and food chains. So again, we can think about adaptations. Some plants are adapted to survive in very low light conditions like on the forest floor. Um, others need full sun um, and the amount of plants that are growing will affect uh, the ecosystem that depends upon them.